Hello, and welcome to this Poly Studies tutorial. In this video, we're going to continue our look at relative clauses in the Pali language. And specifically, we're going to look at the relative adverb. But let's first recap what we've learnt about relative clauses. A relative clause is a type of subordinate clause, and a subordinate clause, like all clauses, contains both a subject and a verb. It's subordinate to the main clause, which means it needs to be joined to another clause in order to make sense. And a relative clause is one which starts with a relative term. And relative clauses are often used to define or identify another noun in the sentence. So if we take the phrase, the house, we might ask, which house? The house that Jack built. The clause, that Jack built, identifies which house we're talking about. In this way, relative clauses add more information about a noun, like an adjective would do. But they allow for much more content than we could ever achieve just using an adjective. Finally, the noun which they qualify is called the antecedent noun. Well, in this tutorial, we're going to be looking at pronominal adverbs and specifically relative adverbs. Now, they're called pronominal because they're formed on the same stems as which pronouns are formed, and they're adverbs because they take the endings which confer adverbial meaning. The term adverb is a bit of a catch-all term, but here I mean words that explain where, when, how, or why an action takes place. So, in Pali, we can form adverbs of place, manner and number, or time. The Pali language actually has a large set of words which are formed in this way, and in effect, they extend the case system to cover adverbial meanings. And you won't be surprised to learn that relative adverbs act in a similar fashion to relative pronouns. Today, we're just going to look at a few of these, which are often used in relative clauses. Also, as well as the forms listed here, you might remember from the tutorial on interrogative pronouns that the pronoun forms of the accusative, instrumental and ablative can also act as adverbs. So, let's now remind ourselves of the anatomy of a relative clause in Pali. Unlike English, the relative clause generally precedes the main clause. We can identify the relative clause because it will begin with a relative term, either a relative pronoun or adverb, formed on the stem ya, while the main clause will generally begin with a correlative pronoun formed on the stem ta. The antecedent, if it's a substantive, will appear in the relative clause, and both the relative and the correlative pronouns will agree with the antecedent noun in both number and gender. But if there's no matching noun in the relative clause, then the correlative pronoun is used as the antecedent. Finally, the relative pronoun takes its case from the function it plays in the relative clause, whilst the correlative pronoun takes its case from the function it plays in the main clause. So in this example, we can see that both the nouns Buddha Hang and Dharma Hang are in accusative case and therefore will be the objects of their respective verbs whilst the pronouns yo and so will be the subjects 
of their respective verbs. If you wish to refresh your memory, this was all covered in the tutorial on relative pronouns. Well, that's how relative pronouns work. But now, if we look at the use of pronominal adverbs, we'll find there are quite a few differences. The main difference is that adverbs are indeclinable. That means they don't change their form to indicate case, gender or number. Now, the good news is, when relative adverbs are used to form relative clauses, their construction is much simpler than with pronouns. For instance, the relative and the correlative adverb in the two clauses often have equivalent forms. And because they're unable to take case, they have a much more limited scope than pronouns. Essentially, it's as if they're two pronouns, both in the same case. And this often has the effect that both the main and relative clauses share a common basis, that is, one of location, time or course, for instance. So now, let's remind ourselves of the adverbs that we're going to be looking at. Yang and Tang are possibly the most commonly used adverbs and have a wide range of meanings. But in relative clauses, they generally take the meanings of what and that. For instance, Yang, Akusalang, Tang, Pahinang. What is unskillful, that is given up. Yang, Anichang, Tang, Dukhang. What is impermanent, that is suffering. Yang, Ichasi, Tang, Vadahi, what you wish, that you say. This can actually be rearranged to mean say what you wish, which in English, what you wish, forms a noun clause, being the object of the verb to say. This type of construction is actually quite common in the Pali language. Yang twang ichasi, tang bunja. What you wish, that you eat, or eat what you like. And now we move on to yena and tena, meaning where and there, and these two are also very common. And when they're used with verbs of motion, they have a peculiar clause construction. Hopefully you'll remember that with verbs of motion, the destination is usually placed in the accusative case. Another way of conveying the same information is with a relative ye natena clause, or in English, a where there clause. Ye na samano, tena mahamato, upasang kamati. Where the monk, there the minister approaches. Although it's standard to translate ye na as where, in this case it has the meaning of towards, towards the monk, there the minister approaches. In this type of construction, the yena clause contains the destination, and notice samano is in the nominative case because it is the subject of its clause, and not in accusative case, which it would be if it was normally following a verb of motion whilst the tainer clause usually contains the thing or person moving and the verb. But sometimes the subject is placed outside of the clause construction. Brahmano yena bhagava, tena upasang kamati. The Brahmin towards the Blessed One, there he approaches, or the Brahmin approaches the Blessed One. Note, though, that often yena is better understood as where. Yena magena so agato. Tena gantung ahang ichami. Where by the path he came, there to go I wish. So we know that the destination, the path by which he came, is the object 
of the verb of motion, to go. So we can rearrange this. I wish to go by the path he came. Next, we have yasma and tasma, because and therefore. These operate pretty much how you would expect. Because fathers planted trees, so we fruits eat. Because he amid monks went forth, so she too to go forth wishes. These clauses require little in the way of rearranging. Next, yata and tata, which are adverbs of manner, and generally can be rendered as and so. Yata pure, tata pacha. As before, so afterwards. As below, so above. As this, so this. Yada and tada mean when and then. When our wishes are fulfilled, then we rejoice. Finally, we come to yava and tava, which can be rendered while or until, and then. Until rises the sun, my lamp then shone. While the self not he sees, the jackal then a tiger he imagines. Or if we rearrange this, while he sees not the self, the jackal imagines he is a tiger. Notice in the first example, the relative Yava clause is something which happens before the main clause, whereas in the second example, it is something which is happening at the same time as the main clause. And we have to decide from context which of these two cases applies. Also, unlike the other clause formations, it's very common for the Tava clause to come before the Yava clause, thus reversing the main and the relative clause. Here, then, you sit until the king you see. An important point to note with relative adverbs is that they can act as conjunctions between clauses. For instance, Ati bo eso ata Yang twang badesi There is friend, a self, of which you speak. Here, the relative term yang joins the two clauses together. And taking another example, the heedful, not they die, who the heedless, as they dead, or to render this into English, the heedful die not, the heedless are as if dead, or like the dead. Finally, yada brahmano kalang karoti, gacha gamang, when the brahman time past, go to the village. The term kalang karoti, time past, is actually an idiom meaning to die. So we can say, when the Brahmin's time has passed, or when the Brahmin has died, go to the village. Now before we bring our look at pronouns to a close, this will be a good place to look at repetition. In Pali, nouns themselves can be repeated to imply emphasis, like very. Repeated demonstrative pronouns can imply variety, meaning several or various, or distribution, as in this and that, or here and there. And repetition of relative adverbs and pronouns implies generality. Yo yo meaning whatever or whomever. Yena yena gachati wherever he goes. Yang yang gamang 
whatever village. And finally note, when a relative adverb or pronoun is repeated, so is the correlative term. So if yata yata is repeated, the correlative tata tata will also be repeated. Well, this is the end of our tutorial on relative adverbs. And it also brings to a close this series on pronouns in the Pali language. Please feel free to subscribe to my channel where there are lots more Pali grammar tutorials. And for more information, please visit my blog.